Yes, indeed. We have uh, the blessings of our producer, Eric Kona. Welcome to the History of LASK one-on-one -on -one sessions. I'm your host, Junior Francis. This series celebrates Southern California scale rock steady and vintage reggae scenes through insightful conversations with legends and key players from today's revival. This is the 17th uh, edition, around, again, one seventh of one-on-one -on -one sessions of our, and our second on this exciting and massive new podcast and YouTube channel. Thanks to regular and returning guests. Uh, welcome. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to watch the program. Today's guest is Ted Morris, a longtime supporter of Skia scene, of the Skia scene, including as a selector, former radio DJ, musician, and manager of popular bands, not only here on the West Coast where we are coming from, but also on the East Coast. Ted, welcome and greetings. Welcome, Junior. I have to say before we jump in how honored I am that, that you and Eric have invited me to be part of this. I've, I've been following the series. Absolutely love what you guys have been doing with this for over the past year. I think I've caught almost all of the episodes and, and the ones I have, and I'm still trying to catch up on the recordings, but fantastic series you guys are doing and, and very proud to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And so even though you're a teacher by profession, you don't have anything else to do but to watch the series. <laughs> well, hey. Yes. <laughs> and, and my little toddler keeps me the most busy, but but after hours, I, I can put on my headphones and, and catch up on those. Wonderful, wonderful. So speaking of your toddler, you got married soon, and uh, your wife invited me to say hi to your son. That was uh, wonderful. Awesome, yeah. Yes. So I want to say hi to your wife and your kids. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to join us. All right. I suppose that uh, he's tender age. He's probably off to bed now. How old is he? And his name? He's going to turn two in a couple of weeks. So uh -huh. just under two. And uh, Melody's downstairs giving him a bath right now. Part of that mm -hmm. normal routine in the evening. And for the record, Melody is your wife. She is my wife. Yep. Yes, sir. Well, good. So talk a little bit about where you were born. I know I met you in Claremont, but you weren't born in Claremont. Even though no, sir. Uh, you don't have a Southern California accent, perhaps you went to some <laughs> Ivy League school. Or, or the suntan, right? Yeah. <laughs> you went to some Ivy League school and they taught you right. how to get rid of your accent. <laughs> I, was, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri and spent most of the, the beginning of my life there uh, and came out to Claremont for college. So when you and I met in 89, uh, that's that I I had come out there for uh, to attend Claremont McKenna College, and got mm -hmm. involved in the radio there. But um, right, pretty you know, elegant and upscale school. Mm. Excuse me. Pretty elegant and upscale college. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a, it was a challenge. I'll tell you that. Yeah. In what sense? Uh, it, it's uh, it just pushed me very hard academically, and maybe I was spending too much time at the radio station, but. Um, but uh, my grades weren't as good as I, I had been in, in high school. So <laughs> had to had work pretty hard there. Mm -hmm. And what year you moved to Claremont? Did you say 89? 89, yeah. 89, okay, right. So I've been out here a handful of years before you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were so, established already. Right, so uh, as a grown up, uh, sorry, when you were growing up, what were some of the bands that really influenced you growing up? Or music then, music band, musician. I don't know to what age you started taking it to live show. Yeah, if they so, took you to live show. Yeah, so I think relevant to the conversation tonight and, and you know, what kind of drove me into ska, like growing up in St. Louis, it was, it was different. It's a much smaller city. So when I was in high school, the, the alternative music scene was, uh, I mean, there was no alternative radio back then. It wasn't, it wasn't like a recognized thing. So all of the underground sounds, we had punk music and funk music and speed metal. And you'd see the same kids at the ska shows that you saw at the metal shows. It's nothing like Los Angeles. Uh, and a lot of the bands in St. Louis in the 80s, there were a couple that had ska influence, but it was more along the lines of Fishbone, like very funk ska oriented mm -hmm. So uh, and, and some, you know, some rock and metal mixed in. So there's a band called The Urge. I went to high school with a few of those guys and um, and they they were very popular in St. Louis. Uh, and then there was another band that people in St. Louis probably don't even remember anymore called Sinister Dane that, um, you know, they had the, the horns and, and did, you know, sort of the ska rhythms. Um, those are the bands that kind of influenced me live when I was out there. 
And then when I moved out to LA, like, and saw that there was a whole scene just for ska and, you know, and I guess we can, we can talk about that as, as we go on, but um, there were a lot of really good bands, live bands out here in those days. Um, and, you know, just learning about bands through compilation records and mixtapes. Mixtapes was a thing before the internet um, and, and people would pass along recommendations of, you know, two-tone bands. I got probably all the two-tone bands were on cassette that I dubbed from friends before I owned my own copies. Uh, and my first introduction to the Scottalites and Desmond Decker and, and Justin Hines, those would have all been from friends making me tapes and introducing mm -hmm. me to it. Interesting. So describe uh, on your arrival, describe the mod and sketch scenes here in Southern California, your earliest remembrance. Yeah. So, um, in, and I, you know, I love to talk about this the way that when I got out here, Los Angeles had a very, the greater Los Angeles area. So yes. Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino counties, we all had a, a pretty unified scene and the same bands would play at all these clubs. Uh, the bands on the scene when I got here, the biggest names were probably the Skeletones. The Specs were really huge. Um, I made friends with them early on and, and had them come out to the Claremont Colleges and play play some shows out there. Um, but I, I really distinctly remember going to uh, a show at the, at the Reseda Country Club. And a band from England called Potato Five was, was playing. And... Um, and I, I remember arriving and we were early. This is, you know, we were getting there, you know, 20 minutes before the doors open because we were driving all the way from Claremont. Uh, and there was a line of people wrapped around the block and they were all dressed as mods. They had the parkas on and the, the flight jackets and buttons all up and down. And I was like, I had never seen anything like that. And that's when I realized that it, it's not just a, a music but it's a scene. It was a scene, and and there was more to it than just the sounds. It was the fashions, and you know, the, the scooters were lined up, you know, all the way down the, the sidewalk. Um, but but that was really that was one of the things that drew me in was just the whole culture of it. It's not just music; it's a whole culture around it here in LA. And for the record, honor about what year was that? Well, that was '89. That was when I first first came out here. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I had seen a couple other shows, you know, out here. That was just the one that really struck me because I was there early and people were just lined up. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, there were a lot of, a lot of, you know, Los Angeles, we'd get all the touring bands, but then we had a lot of local bands that, that, that could support those touring bands. So it was really a, a fantastic scene. Mm -hmm. And how did you secure your spot on KSPC? where we happen to sit in a CM chair. Yeah, I would, so, <laughs> so, I, would, uh, I would be when, before you. When I came out, there was, I mean, I had a handful of records. A lot of them were um, compilation records. So, we, you know, I could have a variety of, I could play the same record three times and play different bands each, each time throughout the show. Um, and I was interested in ska. And there was clearly like this burgeoning scene out here in LA, but there, you know, at KSBC, you could do like a format show that would be playing what they told you to play. And here's the music you can choose from, or you could apply for a specialty show. So I applied for a specialty show. I did a, you know, a, a demo recording of what it would sound like. Uh, and I'll tell you this. So uh, you probably remember Julie. Julie was the general manager back then. And uh, on my tape, I had done like this attempt at doing like a Jamaican accent and it was so embarrassed oh my god it was so embarrassing and she said she said to me she said I like your selections I think this I think this would go over well lose the lose the accent and you can have a show <laughs> so it didn't take so, you long to lose the accent <laughs> god she gave me that advice because I would have been mortified you know you know years later to listen to myself trying to trying to play that 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 part <laughs> um and so I was originally approved. So I did the training and did the demo in the fall of that first semester I was there in, in school. And I was going home to St. Louis in the winters when, when we were on winter break, because it was a month off. Uh, and I got approved for the show when we came back 
so so uh, winter of 1990 is when the show started, the beginning of the, the college semester. So that would be 1999, January, mid-January school resume. 1990 with a zero. Sorry, and, 1990, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, January, thereabouts, January, or maybe even February when the first show played. Um, and I was originally approved for just a two hour show. And I was supposed to do two hours. We had three hour slots, but they told me I could do two hours and then the last hour to play uh, format, the regular station format. And so I was promoting the show for a few weeks when I was back, handing out flyers at, you know, at the live events. I remember it was, I was at a show, it was the Skeletones opening up for Eka Mouse at a, band, at a club called the, I think it was called the Glass Door. Green Pomona. Door. Green Door. Green Door. Green Door. That's it. And, and, uh, this was a, like a week before the, ra the radio show launched. And, this, and I was out in the parking lot after the show, handing out flyers, trying to get everybody interested. And this, this uh, skinhead kid came up. He's like, what? A ska radio show? He's like, that's so exciting. He's like, if you ever need records, if he's like, if you need a, he's like, I've got a lot of records. I'll you know, I can loan them to you if you want them. Uh, he was very animated and very excited about it. His name was Drew, not Culture Drew that you know from reggae but mm -hmm. rude group was his, his name so for the very first show i had him come and be my guest my guest on the show and bring his records and we had so much fun i said come back next week and so the next week he came back again and he never stopped coming he became my co-host so uh so he became the co-host and with his records we got approved to do the full three hours we had plenty of music for three hours um and so that was the beginning of the show the first show was on from Midnight to 3 a.m. on, I guess it was Saturday night, Sunday mornings. That's training, right? <laughs> yeah, he has training. That was earning our, earning our, uh, our uh, stripes. Own. Yeah, earning our stripes. And, uh, and I think, I don't know if we did that for two semesters at that time slot and then ended up <clears throat> getting promoted to back to back to you, or, or maybe it was that next semester that we got back to back to mm -hmm. with your show. Um, but, but yeah, we uh, we did that for a, a little while. People would people would turn on the radio, uh, tune into our show from like parties and stuff. So we'd get callers from all over. That radio show was very request driven. We got phone calls from all the way from Santa Monica to San Bernardino, up in the mountains up there. Um, so yeah, so yeah, that was the beginning of the show. Mm. And how long did the show last? It was five years. So or to more specifically about four and a half years because we so ended a couple of transitions, right? You started late night, then you uh, earn your stripe. They had you on Monday evenings, I think nine yep. to midnight. That's right. Yep. Right. So we did, we did that back to back with you. That was fantastic. I've told so many people how, how much I learned about Jamaican music by being back to back to you and not just the music, but radio presence and how like the energy you bring to a radio if, if people out there have not seen Junior Francis, you've got to find out how to get him on internet radio and, and hear how, how animated he is and how, how, he, how much he loves, how much his passion comes through as he's hosting these shows. But um, we yeah, then we had, Thursday to talk about me, Ted, <laughs> we had Thursday nights for a while uh, and I was back to back. There was, a, there was a young girl before me named Youngie who did like a punk and ska show so this was later on when the orange county scene was developing and and there was a lot more interest in the punk ska and we were moving away from that we were moving more towards traditional ska which which you and i can talk about hopefully uh, more mm -hmm. later but went through a lot of co-hosts so drew was on the show for the first year or so and then he, he moved up north to humboldt county uh, we had i don't know if you remember a girl named cindy Do you remember cindy was uh she was uh, a co-host for a while. I think that was when we were back to back with you. And then uh, Christine was with me for a long time. Uh, she was my girlfriend at that time. She, she yeah, I remember. A, show. Uh, a guy named Chris Gooch was a, a partner for a while. He designed some of our t-shirts when we did the t-shirts later on when the show was getting more popular. Um, yeah, so definitely mm -hmm. not a one man show. Right, right, because I remember when you started following me, I mean, it changed the landscape of the Inland Empire. Because also I learned a lot about the two-tone and the skinhead, which I knew very little about. 
But people are really talking about both shows. You know, you, you caught a lot of the regular listeners, you know, mm -hmm. stayed on. Because I think you played enough traditional for them to listen to. Yeah. yeah then, and, you know, till midnight or thereabout when they fall asleep. And early, early on, there wasn't as much, but I'll, I'll say uh, Drew, Drew Drew was a big influence. He loved the, the skinhead reggae and mm. uh, and he he loved the traditional, like he had a lot of the studio one, like he and I would go out, he would take me to the, the different shops and, and pick up studio one records. Uh, that's when Courtney had Culture Beat open down in Long in Beach. Long Beach. Mm -hmm. So they had, they had a good, good combination of like new ska stuff but a lot of reggae and a lot of original ska uh he was distributing a lot of the studio one vinyl um and and heartbeat was coming out with the the uh cd the yes. cd releases of a lot of those studio mm -hmm. records so a lot of access there um yeah mm -hmm. yeah so that was good i you know the other the other thing that happened was um yeah, I'd still go home for the summers and I would go home. I'd go home for winter for a week, for a month. And then the summers I'd go home for uh, most of June, July and August. So the, in 1991, when I was home for the summer, uh, I proposed a show in St. Louis um, at a radio, uh, a, a public access, like a public radio station out there not affiliated with the, it was more like KPFK. So not affiliated with the college or anything, but a, a you know, very wide range audience, uh, huge station um, and proposed a ska show there. And I remember the process there, I had to give them a demo tape and a, a written application and went into the, uh, like their, their board, the board of that nonprofit would interview the prospective hosts. And in that interview, the, one of the guys, and I wish I remembered who it was, but one of the board members said, you know, in your application, you mentioned, you know, King Edwards and Prince Buster and, and Cox and Dodd. He's like, that's the history that it, he's like, the cultural piece of this kind of music needs to be a part of your show. And that's what's interesting me in it. So if you can guarantee that you're gonna focus on that, um, he's like, you can have that show. And, uh, and that, and so that summer, I was really trying to pick up like everything I could, you know, more CDs and more records uh, to make sure that I was, you know, playing a good balance of that. And, and honestly, from that point, Junior, there was no looking back because by 91, the Los Angeles scene also was going more traditional. And we had mm -hmm. now we had Jump With Joey and Hepcat and, and some of these other bands that were they were playing the, the more authentic uh, attempts at, at doing Jamaican ska and not the not the two tone influenced um, sound and mm -hmm. and, and uh, what you know what had been originally that united scene there's there was a sound that I can I don't consider it what most people think of as third wave that's a little more pop punk and and distortion guitars and sort of a wacky stage presence and Hawaiian shirts and whatnot. There was a there was a sound in the late 80s that was not two tone. It was after two tone, and it was a lot more um, a lot more horn driven, a lot more melodic than two tone. Not quite the new wave new wave uh, influences that two tone had, but a little bit more of its own thing. Didn't sound like Jamaican ska. It didn't sound like two tone, and it wasn't third wave. I, I usually just call that third generation ska. But bands like Let's Go Bowling. And the scofflaws, even some of the toaster stuff like Matt Davis or things that were really horn, horn forward, not just it, two tone. There's it felt to me more about the vocalists and the horns were sort of the background. It now in, in the late 80s, there were bands, the Star Flames, you know, Potato Five, they were playing these songs that they would have instrumental songs in their set where the instrumentals mm -hmm. were being carried by these horns. And that's what the, the LA scene was like in the beginning. Right. Very, very upbeat. Mm, but I want to take you back to radio. So while you were uh, playing, uh, uh, I guess, reggae specialty, Skia Rocksteady, were you also aware of other radio stations here in the greater Los Angeles area? You know, we cover Orange County and the Inland Empire, such as KCRW. You had the reggae beat week. Uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck Foster was there. Roger Stephan, Hank Holmes. You had Miss Wyoways. 
She was on KPFK. Jim Otto in Orange County, K Rock had um, Roberta. He went to the same school you went to. And of course, KSPC, were you aware of these other shows? Did you listen to them and did they influence your presentation and your style? Editing? So um, the ones I was aware of, so I wasn't really turned on to KPFK at that time or, and I didn't know that Chuck was at K, uh, KCRW when I was there. Like I know now, you know, can, I know now what his history was. Uh, I knew about a show called Skank Shaft that was out at KXLU in those days. Uh, and I knew that there was something in Riverside, but I couldn't receive them. And I couldn't receive them where I was. And there was no internet radio back then. So I just, I knew about them. And, and there was, uh, Taisy Phillips was down in Orange County. He and I started about the same time, mm -hmm. but his was, his, at UC Irvine, their radio only broadcasts like a mile. So it was, it was very, very localized uh, down there. So I, I, never, I never got a chance to actually hear his show until years later when I was in Orange County and uh, was able to tune in. Right. You also promoted some concerts on uh, the Claremont Colleges, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take us back. And how, well, how, did, how did you get around to doing that? Where the ideas came from? Did they just so, go from um, the sky or... I'm a reggae DJ now. When I keep saying reggae, more ska rock. Did you play any reggae or was a ska rock? I didn't, play any, I didn't play any reggae. Like even in the early days, the closest thing I got, I guess, was was if, if Drew put on some skinhead reggae in the early, you know, like 1969, 70 mm -hmm. reggae, you know, maybe the latest would be like Red Wed Wine or something, Tony Tribe, <laughs> uh, you know, but but most of what I had was, was ska. And even in the earliest days, I didn't even have very much rock steady uh, that, that, I grew into that. So, um, so if you're talking about the earliest days of the show, it was I was playing ska music and two tone uh, mm -hmm. and modern ska. Um, and how about the concerts you promoted on campus? Yeah, I'm gonna turn on the slide a little bit. Uh huh. Uh, excuse me. So, the um, the first thing I did was I had I had a there was a in college the dorm I lived in did um, they did parties. And, um, you know, when those, you know, college parties where you have a, a keg and you sell admission and you raise money for your dorm, right? Um, and I had a band called, I had the Specs come down. I had, I had befriended those guys, probably because I did the radio show, but, um, you know, I was talking to them and, and convinced them and they were very interested in breaking into sort of the, the college scene. And, and where were they based? Uh, so, so they were they were all over LA. Uh, mm. Some of the guys, I think, a lot of them were up in the valley, uh, and I knew some guys that were like in the San Gabriel Valley from that band. <laughs> but they played a lot in Riverside. So the the, mm -hmm. the the big club that was like consistently promoting ska shows was a uh, was one out in Riverside called Spanky's Cafe, and that right. that started as a cafe, and he did shows at night. And then he expanded into doing, uh, he bought a club in Corona called the Showcase Theater. And, and he did, he continued to do a lot of shows there. But I mean, I remember, you know, Desmond Decker playing in this little tiny <laughs> cafe uh, and the mighty, mighty Boston's coming in and so many people in there and so packed in, it got so hot and humid and sweaty. It literally, literally junior started rain from the ceiling. The, the, the condensation, Perfect. the ceiling started to wow. drip down. <laughs> so but uh anyway so specs came out and did uh a, a show for like a little constant little party basically they just did a party at my dorm that was the first time i got a band out uh and they might have done that twice but then i promoted a couple shows at and what was the response before you move on oh yeah yeah it was it was immense like people loved it like that really put and that put our dorm on the map as as the party dorm and everybody wanted to come to our parties after that. Um, and then I promoted a show the next, uh, the second semester of my radio show, I did one called Ska Mikazi that was at, uh, at Pitzer. Hepcat played, it was when Hepcat was really new, a uh, band called the Isabular Lights that a lot of people know that was their first show apparently that night. I, I had forgotten that was their first show. Um, Specs played again. Um, I think the Federales, I, there was a bunch of bands that played that night. And uh, that was that was interesting because uh, it created a controversy at Pitzer where they uh, the Asian-American um, 
union, whatever the, whatever the student group is for the Asian Americans, uh, students protested it because they thought that it, it was inappropriate to call it skamikaze. Uh, it, was, uh, it was on Pearl Harbor Day. <laughs> so uh, mm. that, that didn't go over well. And they were, there was a newspaper article from one of the professors uh, against it. Um, but the show went forward. And I, you know, people who don't know, I, I lived in Japan for a year uh, before college. And I was a Japanese was half of my major. I was studying a lot about Japanese. So definitely not coming from a place of disrespect at all. Uh, it came actually from a love of, of Jap Japanese culture. Um, and, and, you know, kamikazes to, to me was a, a very honorable, mm -hmm. uh, honorable thing. But um, yeah, so that was the first big show I did, uh, inviting people from outside of the colleges to come in. Uh, and it went over very well. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we made some money. We, we, could, we paid for the, the damage of, of the hole kicked in the wall, the bathroom, or whatever, you know, the things that happened at that show. But uh, that was the first one I promoted. And then we did another one the next year called Spring Beat. And uh, just realized there's a lot of headache in promoting shows. So I think Spring Beat was the last one I did. But that was another really big, a big lineup. Lots of bands mm -hmm. in that one. Back in those days, we get like eight bands on a on a. Yes, and the college would finance you, right? No, I mean we charge admission, and so they they would. Oh. We had to pay rental fee for the space. We'd pay for Pitzer College students to do the sound for us. Like they they had like some club that did mm -hmm. uh, events there, so we had to pay. You know, we paid them, but we charged enough admission that that it could, uh, you know, for your, all your costs. Interesting. Mm. Pay the bands, pay the college, and it, it was basically a break-even event. Mm -hmm. Right. So now let's talk about the two distinct scenes that started really uh, shaping up in the nineties. You had, uh, broadly speaking, Los Angeles being more authentic, for lack of a better definition of saying not authentic. But for the purpose of this conversation, we say Los Angeles was more uh, traditional and authentic. The focus on Orange County was more skia punk. That's uh, right. Side yeah. Of things, and so I, to speak. And I think that's the that's I'm really excited to tell that story. I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't know. A lot of people associate California with the ska punk scene because that's what became commercial and that's what became, you know, widely promoted across the country and across the world, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but when I came out, it was a unified scene. And there was that that third way, that third generation sound, like let's go bowling. There's a band called the Imperial. And for the late arrivals, though, we want to say when you came up, meaning 1989. 89, yeah, 89 into early 90. Uh, when you'd go to a show, it'd be this, you know, the mods from Orange County would ride their scooters up, they'd be there. People from the valley would come down. We'd go out to Riverside and it'd be the same bands and the same crowd. <laughs> Uh, but then what happened was in early, in, in, I guess, late 89, maybe early 90, Jump With Joey came on the scene and they started doing a, a weekly gig. I guess there's three things I, I think we, I put into this. Jump With Joey came out mm -hmm. and showed what it really sounded like to take the, the music seriously. And, you know, and, and it, was, it was jazz musicians playing ska music, just like you had in the early days in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, Hepcat form and started playing and people were like, wait a minute. We've heard bands, you know, like the Ska Flames or, or Potato Five or even even Let's Go Bowling. They would do a cover of a song that that was an original Jamaican song, but nobody played it like it really was supposed to sound until Jump With Joey and Hepcat started doing it. The other thing that happened was in 1990, uh, the Scottalites were establishing themselves as a touring band again. So, you know, they had been on tour. Who were they with? Uh, Peter Tosh? Or they, they went on tour to support some, somebody big. It was either Jimmy Cliff or Peter Tosh in, in 88. I think Bunny Whaler. Was it Bunny Whaler? Yep. Not they, Peter Tosh. Uh, performing oh, Bunny in Orange County. I remember yeah. that one. And, uh, it could have been Bunny. And so that, that apparently that went well. So they, in 90, they started touring again regularly across the country. And so people would come out to live shows and see what, what the Scottalites sounded like. And, and at this time, you know, you still had Roland Alfonso and Tommy McCook hmm. right in front. Uh, and, and I think that influenced a lot of the bands out here. They're like, we want to sound like that. 
So, so all of a sudden you had all these bands at, attempting that in LA and, and at the same time in Orange County, you had bands like No Doubt who were finding more commercial success appealing to like the college kids and even the skeletons playing for the college kids and and you know the frat parties and things like that that were more more of a party scene and they were starting to be more about like just fun and and mix in some familiar sounds like rock and roll and metal and and funk and things like that and and you really started to feel this split where the bands coming up in, in la they would still come out to the shows with suits you know, with neckties and suits and, you know, Fred Perry's because they want to be part of that culture and that scene that I talked about earlier. And in, in Orange County, they were wearing T-shirts and baseball hats and shorts because they were just, you know, they're coming off the beach and they want <laughs> they were going to go have fun. Uh, and it got to the point where, like, the Orange County people didn't want to come up to L.A. anymore. And the L.A. people weren't like we they were turning their noses up and they weren't really interested in that punk sky they're like we wanted this more sophisticated sound we want this more this jazz influenced and and more rhythmic like yeah sophisticated is the best word i can think of um the other thing was that in the la scene at that time you there was like a real increase in violence too and and you know we can talk about you know it's kind of like the modern version of the dance crashers but but um the skinhead, the skinhead scene. So what had been the mod scene when I first got out here went to kind of a rude, there's a lot of rude boys, but then by the time the traditional scene came up, the skinheads were coming out because they were very interested in the retro sounds. They were very interested in the 60s sounds and the 60s styles. And they didn't have much tolerance for people who came to a ska show and instead of dancing, they, you know, started a a mosh pit. Like that's not what that music's about. And so, um, you know, and there was, there was skinhead gangs. And so there's gang on gang violence at the shows. And I think a lot of people in Orange County who weren't familiar with that scene or didn't know people where they could feel protected, they, they stopped coming out. Yeah, I saw a lot less of the Orange County type people uh, that, that I had originally seen, like at the Riverside shows and, and the Reseda Country Club and things like that. Interesting. So... So were there some live shows that feature bands from both the scenes? And I guess I know Taser Philip, uh, he still um, play both styles. Yeah. So by the time the mid nineties, the scene, there was a line of demarcation, total separation now by mid nineties, according to your observation. Uh, you know, no, nothing's a hundred percent right. But I think that, I think the character of LA really shifted that way. Like the, the shows that were promoted by Blackpool and Steady Beat, um, you know, and even the even the Golden Voice shows at, at at the bigger clubs and stuff, I would see a lot more separation. I would see, you know, Hepcat would play with C Spot and Ocean Eleven and Yeska and Mob Town and those bands that had sort of like that culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every once in a while, you'd, you'd see them mixing, but not as much up in LA. And it, mm-hmm. and I think Orange County, you know, they might have, they might have one of those bands come join an Orange County show, but um, you know, they weren't they weren't the biggest draw down there. It was the right. The local. So I think that's when I came on the scene because I didn't see too many of those bands from Orange County that played. Yeah. Uh, you know, for lack of a definition, they not so traditional sound. Yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned Blackpool and uh, Steady Forty Five. How did you meet Lewis? Yeah. So Steady Sorry. Beat. You Steady Beat. Record. He's gave both of his name. Um, yeah. So he, you know, I was doing the radio show. So, you know, just like you, you often have your concert calendar, right? Uh, and when when they're, when we're not in a pandemic, uh, I would have, I would, I would announce shows. And you know, back then there was no Facebook invites. There was no online. You know, so a lot of the people who were into the, the ska scene, they would tune into the show to hear like, what's coming up? Like, what are the shows? Uh, and, and, you know, other than that, you either had to be at a show and get a flyer or know which record stores are going to be the ones that have, have the good flyers. And so, you know, an important thing I did on the show was, was have this concert calendar. Right. And so the promoters would, would call me and they would let me know if there were shows coming up. 
and that I think that's how I first met Lewis was he was promoting shows. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I became basically the the uh, house DJ for for Blackpool and um, and would play in between the sets. So the, the the bands would play and in between the sets, I would I would play music to keep keep the vibe going. Uh, you know, it was, it was a very thankless job. That was, you know, the, the, the DJ between the bands is, is when everybody goes out for their smoke break, you know, uh, back when more people were smoking, but uh, not much respect for the DJs back then. Um, so that I met, you know, that's how I met Lewis. I, you know, he started releasing, um, you know, his, 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 when he started the Steady Beat label, he would send me things to play on the radio show and then, and then he and I actually were roommates for a short period of time right before I moved to Washington, D.C. But, um, yeah, he's, he, I think he was, he was hugely instrumental on the L.A. scene and what the, what the direction the culture went. Uh, and because he promoted all the shows. Like, all of those bands we just talked about, mm-hmm. they all played his shows. And, and every, it felt like every weekend he had a show. <laughs> uh, definitely in those days, in, in those heydays of the early 90s, you know, I, I kept my little my little date books, my little calendar books that I used to read off the calendar, the calendar. And, you know, there was, there was three shows a week out here in LA, like somewhere that you could go, uh, you know, in some weeks, almost every day of the week, there'd be something. So a lot of activity, a lot of different bands, a lot of different venues. Um, but, but Lewis really got things going with steady beat and really, uh, got people excited about that traditional sound. Interesting. And how and when the dynamics was formed and what was your specific role with that band? So the dynamics, so I, you know, there was, I talked about that sort of third generation sound. There was a, there was a band from LA called, and I've got airplanes over here. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, there was a band called Catch 22. And th- there's another band that came later that was sort of a ska punk or I don't know, some kind of band called, called Catch-22 that took that name. But this was, this was an L.A. band uh, that was around probably in 92, uh, maybe 91, but definitely around in 92. And they, um, I knew them. They played on my show. I, I, I did live bands on the show every once in a while. Um, but they had that sort of third wave sound. And, mm-hmm. and at one point, one of the, the trumpet player from that band called me and said, and this was when traditional ska was getting really big. He's like, he's like, I love traditional ska. <laughs> My cousin and I are going to do this project band, and and we want to do traditional ska. And um, he's like, do you can you help me find musicians for this band? And I said, well, I said yes, I can. You know, I've got a lot of contacts. I'll reach out. I'll get some people for you. Um, I said, hey, and I play harmonica. Can I come play your band? <laughs> so. Um, so he he let me he let me join the band, uh, and so I was I was the harmonica player and like percussion and, and what they call the, the front man, where I was working the crowds and stuff. I had my personality from the radio, I guess that that I was pretty comfortable in front of the crowds, um, and and became the manager of the band. And um, we got members from Ocean Eleven and the Israelites and, and uh, some other some other bands together. And started off as a, a ska band playing what what I consider sort of like nursery rhyme ska, like very early Monty, you know, Monty Morris style, very simple ska. Um, and that's what we that's what we originally came out as. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we ended up with two uh, two female singers that were just phenomenal and really pushed us to to start going more in the direction of the, the rock steady sound. Um, Desiree, one of the singers, was originally from Ocean Eleven, and they did a lot of rock study. Uh, and so she was, you know, very natural to bring bring some of that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was my early role there. Interestingly enough, right? Uh, let me take a moment to remind uh, our viewers that this is uh, the 17th episode of the History of Eliska one-on-one sessions, and I'm presently in conversation with the great mm-hmm. Ted Morris from 1989 to the present. Uh, You've been at one level or another working and promoting skia, rock steady, reggae, two tone. They even call you two tone, Ted, at one point, eh? Yeah. With perhaps yeah. little or no thanks, and I know uh, no hardly any praise, <laughs> but you're still at it. 
Yeah. And the, I mean, those early days, that was my, like, that was the thing. A lot of people had radio nicknames. And like I said, Drew's nickname was Rude Drew. And, and I don't know if he came up with Two Tone Ted or who came, if I came up with that, but uh, we had we had our bomber jackets with the names that embroidered on here and all of our buttons and patches and whatnot back in those days. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before I ask you to uh, name the members of the um, Dynamics, but because at one point or another, I'm quite sure that they are going to uh, say, how come you didn't mention us by name? So, but before you do that, I want to ask our wonderful friends to follow us at History of LSK one-on-one -on -one and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our Facebook group. So we're stepping up there. <laughs> we're moving on up. <laughs> yes, sir. So name the members of the Dynamics for us. Well, you know, like a lot of bands with so many members, we went through a lot of changes over the years, right? Um, so, I'll, you know, I can mention like the founding, the founding members that had the concept of it were cousins, Matt, Matt Lujan and, and Eric Morrison. Um, Eric was from Catch-22 and Matt had written a lot of these songs and he was the one that kind of pushed Eric to do a traditional band. Uh, Eric brought over a few guys from Catch-22. So uh, a, a guy named Bully was our, our bass player. Uh, his, his real name was Saul, but we all called him Bully. Um, and uh, Tony was a saxophone player. They came together. Those three guys came together from Catch-22, um, Tony Escarcega. Uh, and we had um, uh, Jason Garcia was the drum, the original drummer. And he, he had been in the Israelites and the band before that called the Federales that were uh, awesome bands, especially the Feds were, were really good. Um, and uh, let's see, Min Pham played guitar. Uh, I know Eric knows Min from his, his various promotions. He did a he did a show down a, a club for many years downtown called Broader Than Broadway. He's of Asian extraction, right? He is. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the guitar player. Um, so Desiree uh, Desiree was the singer from one of the singers from Motion Eleven, and they were broken up at the time. So she came over and started singing for us. Um, what am I forgetting? So let's see. Eric was on trumpet. Matt. Uh, Matt was on keyboards. Um, yeah, over the years, so Brad Pate from C Spot was was in the band for a while, and mm -hmm. he wrote some of our some of the songs that ended up being ones that we recorded that ended up on, on various compilations. Um, and let's see, then then Amber Long joined. She was the, the other singer that really rounded out that du duo of the singers and once we got amber and desiree together it was that's when it was really really hitting um and and we we started to gain in our popularity mm -hmm. um, then there was a there was a period junior when i left la and was living in dc mm -hmm. and when i came back we can talk about this uh, right. like, but, but before we get to that so what at that particular point sets the dynamic apart from the other bands in los angeles because i'm quite sure since you your influence on the radio and you could play harmonica could have gotten you to join other bands, right? Was there something uh, special about that particular group? So my my skills on the harmonica are probably about equal to your skills on the harmonica, I'm guessing. Oh, so. <laughs> so you're speaking it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not in the band because I was a, a skillful harmonica player or because the band necessarily needed a harmonica player. That was, that was but cool. you had influence but because you was on the radio, you were DJ yeah. on the radio. So I had the connections with the promoters, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I was excited to see another band come together to do traditional ska, so wanted to help them get, get launched. Um, you know, I think in the early days, there wasn't that much to set us apart. We did have a lot of like a lot of skinheads in the band. So Eric and Bully and Jason, you know, I think they there was something about uh, like the skinhead scene at that time. They liked to come out and support their friends that were in in bands. So a lot of people came out to support them even before our talent was up there. Uh, we had a lot of a lot of supporters that were just friends. And that's important. Very important. Yeah. To us. yeah. And our the first show we did, um, you know, Lewis put us on a bill because I had that relationship with Luis from Steady Beat. And the lineup was it was Jump with jo it was Hepcat and Jump with Joey and Yeska and us. I'm, I'm trying to remember if Let's Go Bowling was on that, but it was it was a it was a fantastic lineup and and a wonderful way for us to have our debut. So there were a lot of people there to, to see us on our our first show. Mm -hmm. So you hinted that you moved to Washington. Why did you move uh, 
And what year was that? So I, so after I graduated from college, I did a program out here called Teach for America. And I was a, a classroom teacher for a couple of years. And that, that program is supposed to be a two-year commitment. I, I, I had no training in teaching. I, my, my college major was Japanese and economics. So, <laughs> so it had nothing to do with, with teaching a bilingual Spanish kindergarten class in Linwood. But um, I signed up and, and uh, committed to do that for two years and thought after that, I would, you know, I would, I would move on. So I finished my two-year commitment in 95. I graduated from college in 93, uh, finished the commitment in 95, and then moved to Washington, D.C. to work for a, a nonprofit out there because I thought I was doing mm -hmm. a career change. So um, once you got done with school, that was it for you on radio, even though the show was extremely popular. It brought you a lot of fame and notoriety yeah, so, in so many, I, many ways. So, uh, yeah, so the, the radio show continued until I left L.A. So 95 is when I left L.A. So there was a couple of years. Yeah, that you, you, you did drive across here. town to get. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Right. So let's talk about Washington now. What happened when you went to D.C.? Because I know you didn't go to become a politician, right? I, I mean, no, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah, that anything so, is wrong with that necessarily. Yeah, so I, I mean, I went out there to work for a non. I actually went out there for a job I didn't get, <laughs> and it was stuck out there. So, uh, you know, unemployed for a little while. But the interesting thing was from, you know, from the radio show, I knew I knew bands all over the country and all over the world, and had been in communication with some of the guys out there. DC is a is a middle sized city had a really a really thriving ska scene actually and they they had bands at that time it was the checkered cabs the skunks and the pie tasters were bands that a lot of people viewing this probably recognize those names um but again it, it was like it wasn't this this uh traditional ska the way that we had it in la and so i was you know i was at a show one day and i was talking to uh, James McDonald, who was the drummer of the Skunks, and he had just left the band, the Skunks. I said, this is fun. Like, these shows are great, but, but you know, you should see what they're doing in L.A. Like, these traditional bands that are and these jazz-influenced, like, Yes, God, Jump with Joey, that have, like, really strong jazz chops. Like, you know, too bad L.A., it's too bad Washington, D.C. doesn't have a band like that. He's like, oh, I've always wanted to play that kind of ska. He's like, and I know a couple of guys who want to too. Mm -hmm. Let's make a band. Let's do it. <laughs> and so, so we um, we got we got the guitar player from the Checkered Cabs who had just left the Checkered Cabs, the bass player from the Pie Tasters, and James on drums, and the horn players and the keyboard player from the the Skunks, and started a band called Eastern Standard Time. And the the concept was going to be. You know, we're going to play like Eastern Standard Time, of course, is a Scottalite song title. We took the name there and we we're on the East Coast. So Eastern Standard Time. But the other idea was that we we're going to play standards. So we we're going to play ska songs with a little bit of a jazz flavor and play jazz songs with a ska flavor like the Scottalites had originally done. So many of their songs were jazz standards that they just adapted to the ska rhythm. And there was a band at that time called Jazz Jamaica. I don't know if you've heard that that mm, name before, yes. but from from mm -hmm. England and or from UK, I guess. I don't know specifically which part of UK, but um, but yeah, I was like, let's do that. And so that's how we started. It was an all instrumental band, and and we were playing uh, that kind of, that kind of style. Um, the skunks were still together and touring, so we lost like the horn players and the keyboard players shortly after forming they went on the road and so we had to we had to recruit more members and that was really fun because james the drummer had been doing session work with a bunch of jazz guys and so he he invited this this uh you know middle-aged saxophone player fred foss he came in and sat in on sax and it felt like rolling alfonso guest you know guest you know making a guest appearance with our band and he, and he was awesome and then one day one day he, you know, we needed a keyboard player when Eric uh, Morgan left on, on, on tour. And, uh, and he's like, he's like, I know this guy. You, he's like, you got to go to this, this bar in Adams Morgan. He's there on whatever night it was Sunday nights or Monday nights. He's like, you go down there on Monday nights, tell him Fred Foss sent you. And uh, <laughs> I talked to Eric, Eric's on the keyboard. 
the piano. And so I went down there because I lived close to that area and I was helping organize the band. I went down there and the, the gig was this blind man playing piano. He's playing like stride piano, like jazz piano. And he had a, he had a, a dwarf or, you know, I don't know what the politically correct term is, little person on the bar. They would dance on the bar and walk around with a hat to get tips <laughs> while this guy's playing jazz music. It was the most surreal thing you've ever seen. But he was, he was amazing. He's such a good player. And, and I went up to him and I was like, have you ever thought about joining a band? I, I was like, because we've got this band. He's like, okay, let me check it out. So I had him over for dinner and played him like some CDs and records and stuff of, of ska music. I said, this is what we want to play. And his response, like, I, I still remember this, his response was, this music's been around since the 60s and I've never heard it before. This is amazing. He's like, I want to do this. He, and uh, so he joined and, and he, he really changed the band. Like if, if you ever you listen to recordings of the early era of, of Eastern Standard Time, the, the, the piano solos and the organ solos that he played are just like second to none. He's so good. So are those, are those songs available on YouTube? Yeah, I'm sure you can find them on YouTube. And mm -hmm. and Eastern Standard Time, I think they've had like five or six CDs now. They've they've been around for a while, and they they travel internationally. There, people watching this probably have heard of them. Um, they're one of the, one of the bigger bands in, in the country mm -hmm. now, actually, for uh, for carrying the Scott Watch. So you also double as a DJ, right? Like you did out here on the West Coast. You yeah um, in the band, and you also play sets in between band change. Uh, in Washington? No, actually, out there, actually out there, I didn't do much in between mm -hmm. bands. I was, I was mm -hmm. in that band and I was the front man again, working the crowds. We remember we were an instrumental band in the early days. So, uh, you know, I was the one that would step up to the mic, introduce the songs, shout out the, the soloists and things like that. Um, I did have, I did have some DJ gigs out there at some clubs, uh, in, in, uh, in DC, but not, it wasn't really, that was just a strictly DJ thing, not in between bands. Mm -hmm. If I ask you, what was the scene like before? Uh, because I'm not concentrating. I don't have the ability, you know, I suffer from attention deficit disorder. So I'm, I perhaps ask you again, what was the scene like? Because I know there has historically been a reggae scene in DC, but I didn't know that there was a small one back then, but I didn't know that there was even a ska rock steady scene. So the ska scene, it was, uh... It was more similar to what I had found when I came to LA, where it was you know, everybody was mixed in the same scene. It was a much smaller city, so there wasn't as much specialization. Um, you know, it wasn't like LA where there was you know multiple shows every night, you know, every week that you could you could go to just ska shows and and, and be busy all the time. You know, they have shows every every few weeks and. Uh, you know, it, LA was unique. That's the only place, perhaps, uh, outside of London where you could find it. I would guess so. I would guess because so. Maybe by the time scaring New York, at, at New York had a big scene. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, but it was a it was a big scene. I mean, they had scooterists. They had you know oh. mod, mods would come out to those shows, yeah. and they had kids, and they had uh, rude boys. It was it was a very mixed and rude girls, of course, and they had a you know a mixed a mixed crowd in that sense. Uh, and people were open, very open minded to different styles. So. Uh, bands that were a little more punky sounding, but a lot of the bands there in those days had more of the, the two tone or the third generation sound. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody was doing what I considered authentic ska yet, right. uh, and and it, there I guess there were maybe the punk the ska punk thing was just starting out as well. Mm -hmm. So you uh, definitely were a trailblazer in the nation's capital. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for people who don't know, know they are knowing. Congratulations. So let's talk about your return to Los Angeles. Why you came back here? Yeah, so um, I, I missed LA. Like I missed, and I would, I would be hearing about- In what sense? Uh, I mean, the, the weather? Well, that the could be weather, uh, I missed, I actually missed teaching somewhat, uh, the vacations I would get with teaching. Um, so I ended up, I ended up, I was not talented enough to remain in Eastern Standard Time. They definitely outgrew me. And, and when they were ready to do the first European tour, they, they said, uh, they said, okay, so here's the thing, you know, we've got eight members, but we can only afford to take seven. <laughs> so get to what you're doing, the harmonica player. So, 
So that was the end of my days in Easter Saturday time. I got the message. Uh, so that was that was drying up. Uh, my, you know, I was in a relationship that was that was on the rocks out there. So you know, I said let's let's come back to LA, start mm-hmm. over. Uh, and things were really happening out in LA. Lu- Luis's steady beat label was really picking up, and he was communicating with me a lot about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, remember, the dynamics were still together and doing well, and they were communicating with me. And, you know, um, Amber was, you know encouraging me to come back and get involved again with the band mm-hmm. so that was a big allure like uh you know come back and be part of that that scene again mm-hmm. so t- tell us a little bit about the um the club scene in los angeles and the promoters now at from the late 90s into the 2000 when you returned to los angeles what was the scene like yeah so i think uh, the, because the dynamics were still around did you rejoin Dynamics were around. I rejoined as a manager. I think maybe mm-hmm. Eastern Standard Time had, had crushed my confidence enough that I didn't think I should get back on stage. <laughs> but if I was happy to help out where, you know, where I had the connections and, and thought I could help with, with the promotion and the, and the managing of the band. Uh, the Dynamics were ready to do some recording at that point. Actually, I guess we must have done some recording before. We did recording before I left mm-hmm. uh, with the original lineup, but we also went through sort of a, a reinvention of the, the band at that time. So the lineup changed significantly where the, a, a lot of the original members were gone and the sound had started to go more to a more jazzy, uh, more, mm-hmm. more jazz influence. So we we're getting more jazz musicians into the band instead of ska fans that wanted to play music. It was people who played music that we convinced to come Right. Like like I we had done with Eastern Standard Time when, when we brought in like those mm-hmm. jazz. I, I saw how that pushed the level of the band so much. So we had some guys from that were like jazz students from Cal State Northridge and got a whole bunch of them to come be our horn section. Uh, and, you know, Amber was singing solo at that point. Desiree had moved away. Um, the original the original uh, keyboard player wasn't interested anymore. Um, so we got a new keyboard player who you know, then went on to play with, with Ocean Eleven when they reformed and he's now in a band called uh, a band called the Boogaloo Assassins that I know Eric Eric knows well. Um, and, and and that really that really kind of influenced the sound of the of the dynamics moving forward. Mm-hmm. About rock steady and jazz. Right. So the so the band is in hiatus. Uh, you guys are thinking in terms of reuniting, it's been a number of years now. I just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> well, I, I, there was a reunion a few years ago. I okay. Think, I think that uh, it'd be fun to do it again. I know there are certain members of the band that would really like to do it. The, the trick is getting a good drummer and a good bassist that can commit. Um, those, are, those seem to be the hardest to get band members who can do the style. The horns, mm-hmm. the keyboards, if people know jazz, they can usually jump right in. Mm-hmm. But the rhythms, the rhythms of, of ska and rock steady and reggae are so uniquely jamaican that you need you need people who are already familiar with those styles in order right. to do it right i'd say mm-hmm. um, yeah but i think i you know i think you'd probably get some people interested in doing that if we could do it mm-hmm. interestingly so in your opinion what has kept this scene this cast scene specifically thriving here in southern california since you, uh, the eight is up to this yeah point? well so the other the other thing that was different when i came back so I, I had been basically the house DJ for, for Blackpool and Steady Beat until I left, where I, I was kind of the go-to guy. When I came back, there was a whole stable of DJs. He had a whole bunch of guys that he'd rotate through. So I became one. I was, at, you know, now I was uh, uh, just one fish in the pond of, of all these different people that would DJ these different events. So prior, and, to, the, prior to your departure, these DJs weren't on the scene. I didn't know any of I didn't know any of and I mm-hmm. and I think there were I I know there were DJs I know especially prior to me even arriving in, in LA prior to the bands rising up there were like the mod scene had had a lot of DJ nights where the mods would play records uh, so soul nights and they'd mix in some two tone and some scots mm-hmm. uh, you know probably your your previous guest Jerry Miller like there there's probably a lot of DJs in his early days uh, that I, I I just didn't know when I came out. Right, right. Um, and 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 the shows that I wasn't the DJ. Usually the the promoter the club had like 
just a CD on or something that they would play in between the bands. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like the DJ specific nights, um, there were people like I, I just wasn't part of that scene. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know when I know guys, you know, like Mark Morales and the, the they had the Angel City uh, Soul Club out here. Um, I'm not sure when that started and, and how much of that I missed before I, I learned about them. Mm -hmm. I'm Junior Francis and um, presently in conversation with Ted Morris and I'm reminding you to please follow us on History of LSK at one on one at Instagram. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our Facebook group. Again, we're moving on up. Before we were exclusively on Instagram, now we're moving on up to that. You're our second guest on this platform. So the next question I want to ask you is, uh, what are some of your career highlights that you remember that you'll tell your son about when you grow up, when he grows up? Uh, across my the, the whole scar. Yes, man. And okay. start with your arrival here. Yeah. Your baptism oh, no. up at uh, the Claremont College is 1989. Yeah, the radio show is a highlight. Uh, as far as like specific shows, um, you know, some of the more memorable shows that we did, um, the Dynamics, the Dynamics uh, opened for Desmond Decker. That was awesome. We were. And where was we were, that? Was that when he appeared in Long Beach or the Nicholas Factory? I, I want to say it was called. I think it was San Pedro. It was a club called the Waters Club. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I really remember. So early on in the, the radio show, let me go back before the dynamics even, there was a ska festival in Berkeley, California uh, that was humongous. And it was the first time the English Beat members got back together. Bad Manners was playing uh, a whole lineup of, of amazing bands. Roland Alfonso was mm -hmm. sitting in with uh, Donkey Show. Uh, and they, they, I think they sold out the, the Greek theater up there at, at UC Berkeley. It was a huge, like, I don't, I don't know how many thousand people were at that show. I'd never seen a show that big. And um, we had been, you know, they had, had reached out to us to help promote the show down here in Southern California. And the promoter, had, we had contests where they were giving away flights flights to berkeley and and you know, those were the good out. old days <laughs> yeah uh that was that was huge that that was also a, you're not a, kidding a early amazing events they flew me out because i had helped promote it and they had like a, a press conference the night before um so that was that was early days like when when radio just felt like oh man this is such a, a fun you know, <laughs> such an amazing thing to, to be doing with, with my with my time um the dynamics were the opening band the night that roland alfonso played his last show at the skylights at the key club mm -hmm. here, in, here in, in hollywood and and that's that's a very you know i, I don't know i can't call that a highlight is <laughs> is a very sad moment for for but the roland music. got sick took sick right yeah, so he collapsed on stage. Uh, he collapsed on stage and, and hit his head uh, and had to be taken to a hospital and never played again. He never, mm. he never fully recovered from that. And, uh, and um, just, it was so surreal. When you're, in a, when you're in a nightclub and there's hundreds of people in the nightclub with you and it's dead silent. Silent like church, like people like whispering to each other's ears but dead silent for uh, for junior, I'd say it was 45 minutes. Oh, that's so, a lifetime in show at a concert. Silence of just people sitting there, like, is he okay? What what has happened? What what's going to happen? And uh, and, and so they, you know, they finally, you know, were able to get the the paramedics there. They they carried him away to the hospital. Uh, there's a little bit of commotion, and then the band went on. The band the band continued to they they honored you know, the rest of the night. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a very memorable moment for me in, the, in my Scott career. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with Eastern Standard Time, I remember one of my, you know, when we opened for one of my hero bands, Jazz Jamaica, and that was, a, that was we opened for the specials, we opened for Jazz Jamaica. Uh, and so, you know, playing some of those shows, you know, sharing the stage with some of those people, uh, you know, Eric made arrangements for us to, 
to play shows with with Carlos Malcolm, with uh, Laurel Aiken, which I you know we might talk about later on tonight too. I, you know, if there's a chance, but um, you know some of those opportunities to, to to share moments with the band. And you know I, I was listening with so much envy to uh, Jesse Wagner on your previous broadcast and talking about how that what you know there there's that that pride of of sharing a stage and sharing a moment with with somebody but he actually got you know a lot more exposure backstage and and was able to share stories with these people that was something that we as a very opening band you know very <laughs> junior band on the on the ladder like i i didn't get the that he was talking about um but just you know that that just must have been so amazing for him and for me, it was just the honor of being together with those bands on the stage. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Oh, I'll tell you one more, one more highlight. Yes. Uh, one more show that I really loved was with, with Eastern Standard Time. We did a show that was like the week before Christmas, or I forget, it was Christmas season, within a week of Christmas, with a band called the New York Ska Jazz Ensemble. And they had come down to Washington, D.C. And you know, the fact that we had such strong musicians and people could learn songs so quick and so could those guys, they were all really top notch guys. I said, you know, we should do, we should do some, some Christmas standards, like pick some, like some Christmas songs, just add them to the set and invite those guys to, to join. So Eastern Standard Time played and then New York Sky Jazz Ensemble played. And then we had like this, this uh, final set that was like members from all the bands playing like these Christmas songs that we had all agreed on playing. And that was, that was just really cool to, to have like a huge band on stage and everybody knew these songs and everybody's in the, the holiday spirit. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. Run about now. I want to introduce um, a producer and good friend, Eric Kohler to join the conversation. There are some questions from some um, fans that um, our producer. Hello, Tim. Eric. Eric, going to Ted, 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 first I have to ask you, did you, is that a photo? Did you paint that backdrop? Uh, is it, is it a real backdrop? Can, can you, can you please, apologies to the listeners, but for the <laughs> viewers, can you just uh, share, is that, is that reality? Is that where yeah, you this, are? This means that if you're listening to this on a podcast, you need to switch over to YouTube and make sure you have <laughs> the full effect. Well, we had the sunset, like I couldn't have made a picture uh, set the sun like that, but um, I, I, I live in Boyle Heights neighborhood of, of LA, so I'm just east of downtown, so you can see. It's majestic. The, I love that. The scenes there. It, it really is cool. Uh, and he deliberately picked that spot. He deliberately, <laughs> yes. He could have chose anywhere and he chose that. Um, no, I'm loving, loving listening and, and learning about the, the history of, uh, of LA Scott, which is obviously the, the, the name of the series. Um, Ted, before I go into a couple of the fan questions, can you just continue to talk a little bit about the some of the DJs and some of the the, the clubs or promoters, but that, that that you feel have kept the scene going from from the late '90s through, through the 2000s when, when more DJs were prevalent? Um, but you, you touched on a few, but 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 can you just continue that that conversation just a little bit? Yeah. So to talk about to talk about promoters, we we can't uh, we can't fail to mention Chris Murray and the role that. Blue Beat Lounge played in keeping the scene alive. When, Absolutely. when it really was drying up and you weren't seeing these big shows on the weekends anymore, somehow Chris, Chris managed to keep a weeknight gig <laughs> on a regular basis, like every week. It's incredible, yeah. Uh, have, you know, a, a, winning, a winning formula of the Chris Murray combo and then a guest band every week. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes there'd be DJs there, but uh, that was as far as keeping the live bands alive and keeping just the interest in the ska scene when it mm. I think would have otherwise dried up. Um, uh, as far as the DJ scene, so that was a whole whole another scene. And um, and there there is a whole scene and there's there's people that I see at the DJ gigs that I don't see at the live shows. And a lot of people at the live shows that don't that aren't interested in in the DJ gigs. But um, so the you know definitely have to mention Marv Mack in the role he played. Uh, he first had a, a club called Soulside. He he was a uh, he, he was from around still has the, it. Yes, and he I was around from the he's waiting for the pandemic pandemic to from the mod days mm -hmm. and the early skinhead days uh, and and part of a, a scooter scene. And um, you know there's a lot of a lot of overlap between the scooter scene and the mods and the skinheads. And mm -hmm. uh, he had a club called Westside Scooter Club. And, and Soulside came out of the Westside Scooter Club 
as just a way to have entertainment for their scooter events. And, and you know, Marv, correct me if, if you ever see this and things are wrong, make sure you, you let me know so I can set the record straight. But uh, that's my understanding of the inception there. But Soulside really hit off well. And they had a mix of soul music, as the name implies, mm-hmm. old 60s, 60s, you know, uh, Northern soul, sometimes Motown even, uh, and then mixed it with 60s Jamaican music. So ska, rock, steady, reggae. Uh, and that's how I connected with him was, you know, coming in and playing at Soulside as one of his get. He would he had a whole bunch of different people he'd rotate. Usually in those days to start off, usually three DJs a night. Uh, you know, now you go to shows, it's five DJs, whatever. Right. But from there, he spun off. He saw a lot of interest in both among DJs popping up and the fans in the Jamaican music. So in addition to the monthly Soulside Club, he started promoting a club called Trojan Lounge. And so uh, I was one of the found, Mar- it was Marv, me, and this guy, Tim Takehara, who's uh, passed away, unfortunately. But, um, but they, they uh, the three of us started that, and Marv would have usually one rotating additional guest DJ. Mm-hmm. For Trojan Lounge and Trojan Lounge is still going. I'm I'm no longer a resident there, but um, but that's another one that's on a monthly basis when we're not in a pandemic. Uh, really worthwhile checking out. He brings in people from all over the country, all over mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Primarily uh, on the t- um, ones and twos, turntables, not so much bands, right? No, but ba- well, no bands. Yeah, no mm-hmm. bands. This is all turntables, all strictly vinyl. Uh, you know, and if uh, you know, to be more precise, I, I think that it's almost strictly seven inches when when i first started djing for him somehow i got i got permission to bring 12 inch lps <laughs> which which are kind of frowned upon but and people outside of la might not appreciate like the dj scene like there's different tiers like the lowest tier you could be would be if you're playing digital music it's next tier's cds nobody really gives any respect to digital or cds out here the next level up is vinyl strictly vinyl and that's what most of them are most of the scene is strictly seven inch and the elite and is now seven inch strictly mm-hmm. seven inch records yeah. la that's if you're not playing those you're, you're not really uh, you know getting the respect and then the next the highest here is is strictly original press so i you know i'm a cheater <laughs> i have a lot of repress records but i, I can't afford sure of well, course <laughs> well, not, not too many people can, can. But there, there are a number of DJs uh, that, that have the most respect out here. Your first guest on this, well, I guess your second guest on this, Nina Cole, is yeah, really sure. her collection. Yeah, I love Nina. Um, so continuing on, you know, beyond Marv, uh, Rocksteady Lounge is the other, like, long time, I think in their 13th or 14th year now. Mm-hmm. Uh, not sure if this last year counts or not, <laughs> but... Um, but <clears throat> that's, that's been go- ongoing at, a, at, a, at the same club never moved out of the Akbar, uh, originally promoted by Terry Lee, who's still part of it. He had been a bouncer for that bar uh, and met up with Chris Guttenmacher, who was mm-hmm. the original. Rock City Chris, right? Rock City Chris yeah. was the original. Mm-hmm. For that. And I met, I met Chris at one of, one of the shows you guys helped promote, um, you know, those, the, those two mega events you had at the- Hollywood Scott Reggae Fest at the Fonda. Yeah, Music Fest, right? That's why I met Chris in person. I had connected with him online or something, met him in person there uh, and found out about that he was doing this, this club. Um, and um, Ak- Akbar is a, it's a gay bar in LA. So a lot of, you know, in the earliest days, there was a lot of people like, you know, can I go to that club if I'm not really part of that scene? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it, that night has really, you know, become, you know, a, a very diverse mixed crowd um, that, you know, and everyone's welcome. And that's uh, where Nina, Nina used to spend there as well. That's right. So yeah. Chris, when Chris, uh, Chris stepped down, it was a week when he was doing, it, it was a weekly gig, uh, Monday nights, Monday Sunday, nights. It was, it was a very difficult night to do, uh, you know, to get a crowd out for a show. Um, but his, Chris's record collection is just, you know, phenomenal the guy's been collecting for many years and he he worked at in Mebo records and uh, eventually opened his own record store which he now runs in he lives in boston he's running a record store there called wow. blue bag records go check it out if you're okay. mm-hmm. yeah um but uh so chris ran it for a while then he went back to school and couldn't couldn't maintain a the a weeknight 
you know, to 2 a.m. kind of gig. So that's when Nina and her partner, Victor Manzo, took over as the residents. And they ran it for many years. And they really took it from, you know, this local L.A. thing that Chris had really built up, mostly based on the, the respect for his record collection, uh, to becoming like an international. Like they had, mm-hmm. they, they were inviting people over from Japan and from England, uh, different Mexico. Cities. Mexico, they were getting these like well-known collectors and selectors to come be part of this like little tiny, like if you ever go to Akbar, it's, it's the size of most people's apartment. It's not <laughs> that much, you know, it's, and, uh, uh, but you, you know, they'd pack the people in there on, on certain nights and, you know, to Nina and Victor's credit, there would be those amazing nights. It was just like shoulder to shoulder. And then there would be nights when there'd be two people and the bartender and, right. and, and yeah. they, stuck it out they stuck it out through the highs and the lows for many years uh persevered yeah and then they when when nina left for school um ian ian took over ian olivera's the the resident there and he's been there for many years and he also was very involved with trojan lounge for a while okay okay and and we should also uh mention and and give respect to jason lawless who who was dj and promoter around town who who passed a year and a half ago i believe Mm -hmm. yep yeah, and uh, Nina. And it's funny you say that. Nina and and Jason and I, and Victor. The, the, this is right before. I think it's right before Rocksteady Lounge launched. Uh, I think that was Nina's first residency. Jason did a club um, called Ram Jam. There was mm-hmm. me, Jason, right. and Victor, the four of us. And then his formula. He was sort of flipping what uh, what Chris Murray was doing. His idea was resident DJs that w- would maintain the night and then bring in a guest band every week. Interesting. So, okay. So we did that for a while. It it had some really big nights, but then a, a, a few that really were low turnout. So yeah. that that it's only tough, lasted. It's a tough business. Months, yeah, like yeah. like six months or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that was Nina's first residency. I heard her say. So there's that. Then um, Mark Morales, uh, you know, great collector out here. Uh, most the most envious collection i think out here um and he's uh he used to promote shows i think when his you know when his kids were young he he pulled back for a little while for a while he pulled back i'm not sure i can't really speak for his i should speak for his kids for it but i know he pulled back but he still does stuff now and then and, and now uh instead of the the dj like he's he's still an amazing record collector but He's been putting a lot into Angel City Records. Yeah, he and Wally. Yeah, he and Wally have, have produced just like really, really high bar of musicality in mm-hmm. in the records that they put out. Yeah, uh, in the in the show, and he promoted some shows. Um, yeah, some, they did quite a few. Uh, yeah. gay lads. Uh, yeah, 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 with some legends. Larry well. Marshall. Right. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, I can't I believe sound, I, sound I missed, dimension. Uh, I missed sound dimension. Danny Harriet. Yeah, I, I, I missed sound dimension as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, uh, I, you know, and I think I think the big takeaway is is now that we're coming out of the pandemic, it's important if, if we if we all want to keep the uh, the scene thriving and growing, mm-hmm. you got to get out and support whether it's yeah. the DJs or or, yeah. or bands, um, which is a good segue to some of the fan questions. Well, can I, Eric? Can I, oh, sure, of course. Yes, yes. Also yes wanna, I, I also need to shout out uh, Boss Harmony. You know, and the Dub Club guys. Absolutely. I Tom. think that. Um, you know, David, David's a great, amazing collector and selector as well. And in fact, my favorite to watch, like if, if anybody's able to watch dub clubs has a a channel on Twitch, Mm -hmm. so you can see the, you can see him in action, which, you know, sometimes in the live club, you can't, you can't see all the magic he's working, but you know, those guys actually use like, you know, the dub sound effects and, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not, I think a lot of DJs in LA, it's almost like listening to a radio show. Like there's not really, sometimes there's amazing songs, but not quite like the flow from song to song. Sure. But David, David, not only is he a good mixer, like he really like turntable style, like he can mix well, but he adds in the sound effects, you know, and the, the you know, the, the, the little, the little things that make it more of a, 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 a DJ performance than just playing records. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and the fact that, that, you know, he and Tom have brought out just amazing legends to their clubs. You're not kidding, boy. Um, yes. A massive place. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the Maytones, the first time I saw them live was yes. yeah. there. Coming, coming down uh, from Sierra Nevada. Yes, yeah. so we brought yeah. them yeah. down. <laughs> yeah. So 
Yeah. Yeah. No, they they absolutely help. Yeah. The, massive uh, line of legends passed through that plant. Yeah. No. One hundred percent. Um, thank you for for clearly uh, mm -hmm. mentioning them. So, no, you meant, did you? Yeah. So, did so, you leave so, out anyone? No, we, <laughs> we, we could probably go on. Right? And apologies for anyone that we left out. <laughs> um, but but so so along those lines, one of the questions that came in: Who are some of your personal favorite modern day uh, bands that that are continuing along the ska rock steady and kind of old school reggae vibe? Um, you know that are active right now. They're active right now. So my my favorite my favorite band right now is Western Standard Time, and I it like it, it's almost hard to say that they're continuing on from the original. Like they've taken it to another level, sure. like, to this orchestra level, which is just yeah. absolutely fun. The cal huh? Caliber of talent, the, the, the broad, yeah, the yeah. Big bands. I, I like in general, and I and and I, you know, we didn't talk about this earlier, but just I think that when you guys did the 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 Hollywood series at, at the Fonda, at the yeah. Ford. The Ford. Yeah. Wait. No, no, Fonda, the music Fonda. box, Fonda Theater. Fonda, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it turned a corner for me there where I think that when we had seen, we had been lucky enough in LA to have like Justin Hines come through or to have, even in the, early, in the mid nineties, have Desmond Decker or, 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 or Toots come through. They would bring their own backing band, right? Yes. Oh God, these are so good. So this um, is number two. This is number two. I, I had to do a little visual. <laughs> Ken I, Booth. Yeah. Ken Booth. Uh, Uroy unfortunately did not make it. Leroy Sibbles, Ethiopian Leonard Dillon, and of course Stranger Cole. Cole. Yeah. Yep. And, and so, yes. And Ken Booth and Stranger Cole on stage together. Oh, speaking of Bella. Art, Art yeah. Bella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So I, I think that in the early days you know bands would come around and they bring their own band with them on they tour with their band right so first of all which would make it a very expensive tour but those bands would be playing like the synth drums like the you know the electronic drums and they, the key the keyboard would play all the harm the horn mm -hmm. part it didn't sound authentic to me and as much as I, as much respect as i had for the artists like it didn't have the right feel to me the way that when the skylights came through that felt real sure. right yeah uh but then when you guys did these shows, you had the L.A. scene was mature enough that people had, you know, been in bands for five, six, seven years and really built their chops where you could put together multiple backing bands that really played the authentic style. Yeah. They had full horn sections. They had drummers that understood, you know, and they were playing a 60s style and not a, a, an 80s or 90s style to back up these these legends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it just sounded it just sounded so good. And I think you, you kind of set the paradigm that ever since then, when these legends come through, that's sort of how they do it. They come through and they're backed up by the Delirians or the Steady 45s or, you know, the, um, you know, the, the LA All-Stars was, was the name of the sure. band. Yeah. Wow. Right. Um, and, and just made it, it, it a way that you would never get to see those bands anywhere else except LA. Mm. Yeah. And the legends clearly recognize that. And we've heard whether it was from Stranger Cole to Derek mm -hmm. Morgan, I mean, Pat Kelly, the, the praises that they gave, but yep. yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So so a couple of the bands that you mentioned, obviously you mentioned Western Standard Time, Steady 45s, Delarians, they're obviously active and, and doing really well. Um, any other any other bands uh, along those lines that, you, that you're a fan of or that you'd like for, to recommend to, to listeners and fans? Uh, so there's so there's this collective in Switzerland that's just amazing that they just they just put out. Uh, What's the name? So okay, now I'm going to try to remember what it was called. I might have to come back. <laughs> okay, so why are you talking? I'm quite sure you'll come back. Uh, but uh, what was it called? Um, this guy named Jay Moonlighter, I think, is his name. But. Um, I'm gonna uh, gosh, I'm gonna have to we'll, put we'll, it in the we comments. Can add it to the comments. No problem. Uh, but um, but they but he's he's got he's got a really authentic sound on, on the 45s. He's putting out um, and and another band that's part of that label that uh, the same musicians are involved with. They had a band called the the Mountaineers. Weird mm. a weird name, but they they sound really good. Um, you know, Joey Altruda is you know Jump with Joey. I've mentioned them a lot tonight was very influential and i know joey's uh producing some you know putting out some, yeah. some stuff or uh re-releasing re -releasing some stuff that he reported sure. back today 
yeah. that I would recommend for anybody to grab. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I might, some more names might come to me. No, as no, for sure, for sure. There's, yeah. there's a band from Mexico called the Travelers All Stars. Oh, yes. I had a chance to see we, them. We, we talked about them, I've seen often, them live, yeah. but I've seen their videos. Yeah. Yeah, they're, uh, they are incredible. Um, so, so one of the questions, and you touched on this briefly earlier, and just for another visual, this is Laurel Aiken show. This was Laurel's, if not the last, one of his last performances in Southern California downtown Pomona. He was he came on tour back by the Austonians and this was in July of 99. The dynamics were the opening <laughs> band or were supposed to be. So 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 we Should touched on so, so we touched on earlier uh you as the role of the manager and 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 I can relate as having managed a, a few acts over the years. But so so walk us through that night and and what you experienced and 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 some of the challenges uh, uh being a manager yeah so they yeah so um i mentioned that one of the the two hardest positions to fill are the bass player and the drummer and mm -hmm. we had a phenomenal bass player you know i don't think i should call him out by name no, he, no worries <laughs> but um but the bass player, he had played with C-Spot. He, he was just phenomenal, uh, played the upright bass. And for whatever reason, he didn't show up that night. And he didn't tell us. I think it was, he was ready to, to, to drop out of the band, but didn't know how to do it without making us all sad and upset. So yeah, we were out front and, you know, talking to the singer and we're like, where the hell is he? Like, what? This is a huge show. Like, yeah. you know, um, yeah. or Lakin for God's sake. Um, and, and he didn't show up, so we couldn't play. And, and I think that was the last gig we ever got. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think we tried to audition other bass players, but we, it was, we never found anybody who could do the bass right. So I think the rest of the band just were deflated after after that experience. Well, well hopefully you and the you and the band were able to enjoy Laurel that night because it was, it was well, quite yeah. it was quite a quite a wonderful performance, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, for sure. I somebody pulled up a picture of of me and Laurel recently from that show, and I oh, I wow. really forgotten that that picture existed. So that was that was yeah fun. yeah I know Kim Lazarus came out to that show and. Mm -hmm. and uh, I have a picture with with Laurel and Ken, um, and and earlier you had you had referenced him, but you didn't say his name. So because he's a friend of both of ours, I want to make sure Bill Purdy. Bill Purdy yeah. was the was a keyboardist that you were referencing as it related yep. to to joining Dynamics and went on to obviously do Ocean Eleven and Alpha mm -hmm. So, so yeah. shout and, out shout out the, to Bill and uh, the sax player too, Joe Bautista was with the oh, Dynamics right. and went with Joe. Yeah. I mean with with Bill to play with Ocean Eleven when they reformed, and from there to uh boogaloo assassins yeah we'll, we'll have to do a special sometime that talks about the the uh members former members of ska bands that went on to play in either you know reggae bands latin bands uh, swing bands or any of those others. and some move on to international fame right yeah like oliver yeah, yeah like oliver, oliver charles, charles who's, who's going to be one uh, of our future he guests was the, he was the drummer on our on some of our recordings he never mm. he never gig live with us but um we were the, the seven the, the seven inch that the dynamics put out was, was recorded. The Ocean, yeah, we recorded at the Ocean Eleven studio oh, okay. and, and, and arranged for Oliver to play with us for that. Man, yeah, he, he really <laughs> put us in a, in a different Oliver's, level. Too. Oliver's one of the best. Yeah, we're looking forward to having and him. And an excellent, a, a magnificent, a terrific, I don't know, oh, adjective artist, to describe yes. it. Artist. Yeah. Oh, yeah, who he knew? Can play, he can it's, play. It's, it's not fair. It's not no, fair. I, that you know, talent, you know, I, I, I really despise them. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, That's yeah, horrible. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you saw it. Everybody yeah. see it. Yeah. 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 A lot of love for all of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, but the talent. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, 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 Ted, as we're, as we're nearing the end, and, I, and I've truly loved and, and learned and, and it's wonderful to reminisce, but anything that we didn't touch on it. Oh, we can go on and on, but anything that, that you'd like, uh, whether it's current project, future project, or anything at all that you'd like to share with, with our listeners and viewers? Uh, yeah, no, no current, no current projects. Um, you know, once, once the DJ scene starts up again, you know, uh, really love, love doing that. Um, definitely, definitely a labor of love in, in that world. Um, 
you know, looking forward to seeing a lot of my friends in person again. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had a long tradition of doing big birthday parties in this backyard uh, where a lot of my DJ friends come and, and, and entertain for the night and, and hope that this July we'll get that back on the road. So uh, yeah, but just really grateful to be here. I remembered a couple of bands I should mention. Yes, do it. People who love so not just the traditional sound, but like the ska jazz sound, which I, I really appreciate a lot. The French scene has some really cool bands. There's a band called the, the Nancy Ska Jazz Orchestra, one called the Foolish Ska Jazz Orchestra. Okay. Um, wow. You know, people- if Based the, across the pond are here in California. They're in France. They're in France. France. Those are French bands. And I don't know what it is about the, the, the French scene, but the, the, just the jazz, the jazz, elements of it mm -hmm. uh, this is really fun okay uh, a lot of talent there and I, I i don't know for sure that they're both around still but i know they're both pretty recent so i, I think they are cool uh, yeah but you know I, i'm on i'm on facebook if people want to find me there i can you know be sure to send links or whatever to to yeah yeah i, I believe you're also on instagram right so facebook and instagram you, you yeah. want to give you want to give your handles uh what is my handle? I think it's just Ted Morris. Um, I, you know, I can add it to the links under your, yeah. uh, your yeah. YouTube cool. uh, posts or things like that. But uh, on, uh, on Instagram, it's Ted Morris LA. I think it's Ted underscore Morris underscore LA. Right, right. That That's it. Yeah. Well, Junior. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Ted. I uh, want to remind our viewers to follow us on, uh, his at History of Alaska on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our Facebook group. Uh, this series is produced by uh, Eric Kohler um, for the Rockery Radio. Uh, again, please follow us at Rockery Radio. That's Rockery underscore radio on Instagram for fresh um, rock, rhythm, and soul Spotify playlists that are posted daily. I don't know how you guys do it, Eric, but congratulations. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to my other partner in crime. Shout oh, out to my goodness. So you got talking um, about discipline. Right? It's profound. <laughs> Unmatched, Eric Ola, yes. And I want to thank the supporters and the viewers and you too, Ted, for taking time away from your family, your, your newly born son and your wife. Yeah, and, to and, talk and, to us. and Ted, thank you for all your mm -hmm. ongoing support of of, uh, of this series that we're doing and everything you do for the scene mm -hmm. uh clearly appreciated and this has been a fun hang still amazed by your by your by your backdrop there uh you get you get the trophy uh, on that one you know um, and junior thank you for everything of course. Uh, thanks for our listeners um and our uh, whether it's returning uh, listeners and viewers mm -hmm. or, or brand new ones look for a lot more of this and uh we're signing off ted have yeah. a wonderful night junior thank you yeah, so you much as well it's been mm -hmm. an honor it's been an honor, you guys. Uh, yes, catching up yeah. again. Yeah, okay. much, lo much love and respect. All right, take care. Bye.